uh, today, or tomorrow, rather, office hours, reminder, 2 to 3 on Thursday, and uh, Monday is noon to 1, if you want to figure there, and it's in 2084 VLSB. As a reminder, uh, the reader is available at Coffee Central, which is 2576 Bancroft. We're also sending it out by vSpace. Um, it's probably probably more cost effective to buy it, but that's your total decision. I know some people like to keep it online and not actually print out a hard copy. Um, today, we're going to do nervous muscle, a little bit on tissue organs, which is pages 10 to 11. We'll talk a little bit about action potential. The diagram is actually on the last page of the manual. It's just I made a field decision last night to uh, talk a little bit more about action potential today. Uh, questions on page 12. You'll see questions peppered throughout the reader, and you should attempt to answer them. It'll give you a sense of understanding the material. And then we'll do, get into hormone action, feedback mechanism, stress response, agonist antagonist, and we get as far mechanism of steroid hormones, which is uh, a topic that's in the news quite often. Um, so just I always like to also start with a brief review of the previous lecture. So some key terms. Uh, we talked about cell-cell interactions. Uh, know the differences between gap junctions, adherence junctions, desmosomes, and pipe junctions. Gap junctions are pores. Adherence and desmosomes involve adhesion. Pipe junctions involve sealing and selective permeability. Connections are uh, the proteins in gap junctions. And adherence junctions, desmosomes, and pipe junctions, you have transmembrane proteins, same ones on both sides of the cell. And then you have intracellular proteins that are near the surface or attached to the inside surface, forms a protein complex, which regulates these structures. And they're very important, lots of diseases. I'd say in cancer, pretty much all this is disrupted one way, shape, or form. But there's some specific diseases, such as blistering disease, where it's a defect in desmosomes um, on the skin, skin cells. So there's a lot of interesting areas there. Okay? So to give a sense of that. Then we got into epithelial tissue. Three of the main functions of epithelial tissue are protection. Epithelial tissue surrounds all the organs, including your body, your skin cells. They form a barrier in between cells, and it's selective, it's very much involved in secretion and absorption, such as in the intestinal cells. One point I wanted to make um, that um, in epithelial tissue, tight junctions and adhesion junctions, TJ tight junctions, AJ adherence junctions work together because you need adhesion and sealing uh, to uh, have this kind of cell-cell um, interaction. When this happens, the different surfaces of the cell actually are different. It's called polarity. I didn't really stress it too much on Monday. But I did want to mention that the surface of the cell is facing, say, the lumen. So in this case, uh, the lumen of the, uh, the mammary gland or the intestine is called the apical surface. And the, s the, the part of it that faces the basement membrane, usually the blood system, is called the basal surface. So they're actually different surfaces. And functionality can be quite different. So for example, in the mammary glands, you secrete the milk proteins out the apical surface, but not out the basal surface. So that's very important, obviously, for uh, uh, physiological function. Okay? And then we talked about cell shape, which plays a role in all this. Uh, squamous cells are flat and leaky. Good example. Capillaries. Question. Uh, what does polarity have to do with this? Polarity is the fact that each side of the cell is different. The definition of polarity in this case is it's just different. It's not the same thing all the way around. Okay? Just like there's a polarity to the classroom. The board's on this side, and the light system and the projector system's up on that side. There's a polarity to the classroom. If it was random, this classroom wouldn't work. Or it might work, but not as well. Same with the cells. You need this, uh, different functions on different sides of the cell. Okay? Good question. And then so squamous cells are leaky. Capillaries are a classic example. The last four or five lectures, we'll talk a lot about capillaries. Columnar cells are involved in massive secretion and absorption. The way to think about it is intestines. Cuboidal cells are kind of cube like, rounded like, and involve specialized secretion. A good example is hormone secretion, where you're just putting out a little bit of it. And then you have layers, simple and stratified. Simple means one, stratified means greater than one. Pretty straightforward definition there. Okay? Then we talked about connective tissue. I just wanted to add something based on a question that was asked in class about tendons. And that is, your cells form an extracellular matrix. Osteoblasts form bone. Chondrocytes form cartilage, which we talked about. Adipocytes, fat droplets, plasma, plasma. And I looked up tendons and ligaments and so forth. It turns out these are also fibroblasts. And then I got to thinking that they actually separate the kinds of fibroblasts that make collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers from fibroblasts that make tendons and ligaments. And I think that's kind of not really a good way of thinking about it. So therefore, the way we're going to think about it is fibroblasts are the cells. They produce fibers, and some of these fibers can make tendons and ligaments. So it's all a generally similar set of cells called fibroblasts. So whoever asked that question, I forget who it was, it was somewhere in this part of the room. Very good question. Maybe think about it. And one, by the way, as an aside, one of the new therapies are trying to develop stem cells to make new kinds of tendons for tendon injuries because it's a big-time sports-related injury, same with ligaments. So there's a lot of they're not quite successful yet, but they're playing with these kinds of issues. And those of you going on to med school later on might in fact get into this as an area. You never know. Okay. All right. Questions on what we talked about Monday. Okay. So then we started in on uh, nervous tissue, and I wanted to finish the discussion. You have neurons. Which are the nerve cells, the, the, the signaling. Glial cells, the glial cells is about 10 to 50 times as much. And the glial cells provide the nutrients. These guys provide nutrients. There's actually a lot of different kinds of glial cells. They also provide insulation. And there's maybe six or seven different types of glial cells. An example is a Schwann cell. You don't need to know that. Just know that the other types of cells involved in the nervous system are glial cells. So we're now talking about the neur um, a neuron. And I drew over a couple boards here. Neuron, has, what does it? takes a signal from one side of the cell and sends it out to the other side of the cell rather quickly. And the input comes in through the dendrite. So this is the input into the cell. And the signal gets transmitted through the cell to the axon, which is the output. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. What happens is there's a synapse or a gap between the cells. And when the signal gets down to the synapse, it sends across hormone-like molecules called neurotransmitters. An example might be endorphin or catecholamines. You may have heard of those, some of those. There's a whole bunch of them. I think there's 25 or 30 such neurotransmitters. And these then bind to receptors on the effector cell and continues the signal. So it's a, it's a method of pulling and getting these neurotransmitters to do what they're supposed to do. On many neurons, but not all neurons, on many of them, there's a, there's a structure called the myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath provides not only provides an insulation to the axon, but also accelerates the signal. So the myelin sheath will accelerate. Let's talk about accelerates the signal and provides some insulation. Okay? Again, not all neurons have it, but a lot of them do. Okay? And neural parts, this is the nucleus in the cell body. Like any good self-respecting cell other than a red blood cell um, and a platelet, it has a nucleus. Okay? Any questions on the structure? So what happens, and what does this, this guy do? And it sends something in called an action potential. So let me talk about that. The signal that gets transduced is called an action potential. You may or may not have heard of that. And neurons clearly have action potentials, but it's not the only cell type that does this. Um, you can have clearly neurons do it. But also cardiac cells, and the cell type we'll talk about Friday, beta islet cells of the pancreas that secrete insulin, and there are others. So not, it's not just limited to neurons. That's an important point to, uh, to see there. Okay? So what is, the action, what is an action potential? An action potential is an ion flux
So in the resting state, so here's, this is the plasma membrane of the axon. So here's the signal coming in. This is the axon, plasma membrane both sides of the axon. So this line here is that upper line there. This bottom line is the bottom part of the axon. So in the resting state, you have positive charge on the outside and negative charge on the inside of this. This is the resting state when so there's no signal. So when there's a signal, it could be anything from a neurotransmitter hitting a cell to calcium changes and so forth. When the signal hits, there's a massive opening of sodium channels. So sodium channels are pores. Okay, they're actually called voltage-gated. You don't need to worry about that. They're just um, sodium channels. So what happens is, across this whole membrane, massive amounts of sodium start rolling inside the axon. It happens here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here. It's a cascade. It doesn't all happen simultaneously. It's probably simultaneous in terms of speed. It's like the speed of light going fast, right? You can't tell if it's simultaneous or not. This happens extremely quickly, but it is a cascade. And when you dump, when these channels open up, it dumps sodium on the inside. This is called depolarization. Because it used to be positive on the outside, negative on the inside. Now you get all this positive charge rolling in on the inside of the neuron. Okay? So this sweeps down. And when it hits the synapse, it causes the neurotransmitter to get secreted to the effector cell. But now you have to regenerate back to the resting state. So what happens is the sodium channels close and potassium channels open. So what happens, this kind of happens in sequence. So what happens then is potassium then gets kicked out of the cell and the sodium can no longer go back in. This is called repolarization. You're getting the positive charge on the outside. And then, after some time, you go back to the resting state. What happens is you get a slow movement of potassium and sodium back to their original states. And potassium comes back in, sodium goes back out. So let's go over that. Signal comes in and hits the axon. You want to move it over to the effector cell. Your resting stage, sodium channels open. Massive input of sodium in the cascade. It's called depolarization because you're messing around with those charges. What used to be positive on the negative on the inside now becomes positive very transiently. You close the sodium channel at a certain level of depolarization. So a potassium channel open up, potassium goes out. And then eventually in the resting stage, you get a reequilibration. So sodium comes, potassium comes back in, sodium comes back out. Okay? Any questions on action potential? Again, this will happen in cardiac muscle questions. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, molecules move by concentration difference. It's exactly right. In this case, it's really clear cut to see because it's a positive to a negative. So the sodium's rushing in to meet that negative charge to neutralize it. So that's why it's depolarized. But then you push out the potassium back, back out to repolarize the charge. So the polarization refers to the charge. And this is really the extent of action potential you need to know about. Yes. And that happens here. When uh, the potassium gets kicked out, a little bit of sodium goes out too, and there's a small little hyperpolarization. You do not need to know that. But that's a very important point in the process. I just want you to get the basic concept. Okay, but it's all charge differential. Okay? So what the myelin sheath does, it accelerates this process. So the myelin sheath accelerates. It provides insulation and allows the action potential basically to jump, as I understand it, between where the, these little areas of myelin sheath. The action potential can actually jump each of those. So it actually accelerates the action potential. So that's one of the roles. Besides insulation, it actually plays a role of getting the signal out very quickly. Okay? Yes? Yes? Uh, they, well, there's, there's a small movement of it to reach equilibrium again. Yeah. I'm talking about this massive opening of these gated, voltage gated channels. There's some small channels that cause a little bit of movement of the, of the ions. Okay? So you've got the massive floodgates versus the little, the little ones that keep it going in terms of equilibrium. Very good question. Okay? So. Myelin sheath, there's actually, as you can imagine, all this, there's a lot of attention played to neural diseases, and there's a disease called multiple sclerosis, which is a degradation or degeneration of the myelin sheath. And it's one of these uh, diseases that takes a long time to really manifest itself, but the people that have this start out with, they'll have tremors, tingling in their arms and so forth, numbness, things of that sort. So as you change the way the signal can occur, there's clear cases of disease states. This is one of multiple, of many kinds of uh, neural-related diseases that re relate to the system. Okay? Question? Okay, good. Again, this is the extent of the action potential you need to know about, but it's kind of the basis of thinking about it. Now, the last tissue we'll very briefly mention is uh, muscle tissue. And just a real brief slide by a muscle. You've got skeletal muscle, which is voluntary, such as my ability to write on this chalkboard. And this skeletal muscle is striated. So here's a cell, here's a nucleus. Under the microscope, you see these striations. And this is due to the actin cytoskeleton and uh, microfilaments. So just say cytoskeleton. And it's really just a visual. Now you also have cardiac muscle, which we'll talk a little bit about later when we talk about heart uh, functionality. Cardiac is also striated, but it's obviously not uh, voluntary, right? Because you're not thinking about, okay, beat, okay, beat, okay, beat, right? It keeps going on its own. And it is branched and contractile. And finally, you have smooth muscle, which is involuntary and no striations. And this is the uh, muscle around a lot of your, uh, like, for example, a good example is your digestive system. You don't want to sit there and say to yourself, okay, I ate breakfast this morning, I want to move my food from upper to lower, right? You don't, you don't, you're not consciously telling your body to do this. It's doing it on its own. This is due to all your smooth and voluntary muscle system that's uh, make, making a lot of the whole system work. Okay? Questions on that? Now, one brief question. Exactly what I mean, branched. The cells have branches to, the, to, to them. They're kind of, uh, they're, they're shaped, the way they're shaped. Okay? Now, if tissues work together, and again, this is, a very, this is one of many examples, but a good one is the stomach. So here's the lumen of the stomach. And we're going to do a cross section on one of the walls. So here's the lumen. The first layer is called mucosa layer. And this is made up of epithelial tissue. Now, given what you know about epithelial tissue, what is the shape of the epithelial cells facing the lumen of the stomach and involved in secreting, massively secreting material into the stomach? There's some hints in the way I ask that question. What's the shape of the epithelial cells? Clumnar, exactly right. Because they're involved in massive secretions. So these are clumnar. 
Then you have a submucosa layer underneath that, which is a mixture of connective tissue and nerve tissue. Then you have a muscularis layer from the name. And what type of muscle do you think it is? Cardiac, voluntary, or involuntary, or smooth? Smooth, exactly right. Then you have another layer called serosa, which is the, other, which is the outer wall of the uh, stomach. And the serosa layer is connective and uh, epithelial. So these are just different la layers uh, through the lumen. And all the organs are like this. The point being, you have functionally related tissue that pulls together and forms an organ. And then as you'll see, you have functionally related organ systems that give functionally related organs that provide a system. So it's all interrelated, all interconnected, all functionally coordinated. Okay? Question. Okay, so the next topic we'll hit, and this will be what I talked about, we will touch on a little bit as uh, the series goes on here. So hormones, you are your hormones. That is my point of view on this. Hormones are involved in communication, physiological regulation over distances, both short and short distances and long distances. Now hormones control a lot. It's used in a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, disease states and symptoms. So for example, uh, certain kinds of diabetics can be treated with insulin, insulin being a hormone. There's a whole uh, issue on hormone therapy for women undergoing menopause. It's basically estrogen or a combination of estrogen that you're being treated with. So you can change a lot with your hormones. There's also an ethical issue, and some of you, a lot of you going into medicine will see this firsthand, and that is you can use hormones to change your, how you function. So for example, anabolic steroids or androgens, you can use to build massive muscle, and that comes out in the news quite a bit. You can use human growth hormone to recover from uh, various um, injuries much quicker, or you can use it to grow. So, uh, so for example, the ethical issue there is I have a colleague a couple years ago, about 10 years ago, who was asked, who's an uh, MD, was asked if their kid could have some growth hormone at the age of 11 so they can grow bigger, even though it's a fairly normal sized kid. And of course, the person said, forget it, that's unethical. Okay? But you guys going into medicine will see much more of this as we know more about it. Now, there are side effects. You see all these people that take a lot of anabolic steroids, right? They build up muscles. There's downsides to it. One is obviously behavior. Okay? There's examples of that. Uh, there's a high risk for androgen sensitive cancers, such as um, testicular cancer, certain prostate cancers, for example, very high rate of risk of that. And uh, it takes a while for that to manifest, but all these people that took massive steroids in the 80s and 70s, you'll see this effect coming up soon. You're starting to see that. Secondly, you can have a lot of secondary effects. Men can grow breasts, and women can go bald if you take a lot of androgens. I mean, nothing's wrong with baldness here, okay? You gotta understand this. But the point is, you can change your behavior and body type through hormones. And therefore, and you see it in medicine a lot. It's used in, for, you know, for medical treatment. Those of you going to medicine will see a lot of things you prescribe that involve hormone, hormone related systems. A lot of cancer therapies are involved in this, but you'll see a lot of unethical use. And you have to be aware of it. Therefore, important to know the mechanism. Therefore, important to discuss it here in Bio 1A. Okay? All right. So, how do we think about hormone action? There's a couple, there's a couple kinds of definitions, but I like to think of it in terms of a mechanism. So, you have a basic hormone, and it binds to a receptor. So, for the next bit of time here, H will be hormone, and R will be receptor. We'll talk a little bit about what these all mean, actually. So, you have a binding reaction. You got a hormone receptor complex. There's a change in the way the receptor, change in the way the receptor interacts with cell components. And you'll see for steroids, that could be DNA. For protein hormones, it could be protein-protein interactions. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then as a result of this change, there is a response in the cells. And if there's a response in the cells, there's a response in the tissues. Therefore, a response in the organs. Therefore, a response in the whole person. And this response is due to these molecular changes that take place. Now, you have lots of different kinds of hormones. This is important to be aware of. You have steroids. You've got lipids, such as prostaglandin. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. I'll bring this word back down in a second. You've got proteins. You've got peptides. You've got amino acid. AA is amino acid derivative. Um, and you've got other kinds of signals out there that act hormone-like. And that would be like gases, for example, and maybe like stress, uh, environmental changes. And I give a parenthesis around this because the, the gas is not really a hormone, but certain gases like nitric oxide give a hormone-like response. And you'll see where that fits in in human reproduction. Okay? So it could be basically, if you think about it, it's almost anything. Lots of different molecules. Now, the receptors are proteins, and they're basically two general classes, those that are transmembrane on the plasma membrane, and those that are intracellular. And as you will see, the steroid receptors tend to be intracell or intracellular for the most part. And all the protein hormones, such as insulin and glucagon, which we'll talk about, you guys will be experts on that by Friday, work by transmembrane proteins. Okay? So there are differences in how these receptors are used and what they do. Okay? And in terms of selectivity, just based on the short discussion, and I'll put it up here, not all cells respond to every hormone. Okay? So there's a selective kind of response to all these different cells. So the selectivity of the response is due to the presence of a hormone, which one is floating about, the presence of the receptor, 